So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. We've been talking about this presentation for a, a number of weeks and it keeps on shifting and changing sort of the approach that we're thinking of, but I think that only has added to the depth, uh, the many layers that we've begun to explore and we're looking forward to sharing um, some of what we've been discussing with you and furthering that uh, exploration of all that we've been engaged in and continue to be engaged in. We, um, the, the, the presentation is entitled Tending to Trauma. And uh, we, in this session, are going to be sharing some interconnected explorations that we've been uh, involved in for over four years, I believe. Um, in her seminal work, Trauma and Recovery, in 1992, Judith, Judith Herman wrote that traumatic reactions occur when action is of no avail. Importantly, in that text as well, she uh, shared the importance of contextualizing the environment um, in which traumatic experiences occur uh, to help appreciate and understand people's reaction to overwhelming life experiences. And in this, um, present session, we're going to be talking about the work that we've done initiated by Michael Frost, who's here with us, uh, and is going to be sharing his story, uh, an autistic man, artist, and activist. He reached out to us. He was engaged in various ways with different offerings and opportunities at the university, and then reached out quite formally in a way to request help with routine dental visits he found traumatizing due to sensory issues um, that he experienced. And out of this came an expanding collaboration uh, that we will be sharing here with you today that has, in fact, uh, we would all agree, we've been talking about this, has sort of ch changed and transformed all of us and the things that we imagine um, are possible for how we can uh, work together um, and, uh, and help to initiate changes needed uh, that aren't bound within an industrial sort of model of education or healthcare, et cetera. And uh, so with that, I'll, I'll uh, just to share who I am, I think we're gonna do some really quick introductions and we would, you know, I think it'd be really lovely for um, Ken and Daniela for you to share who you are as well uh, within this context. Uh, so I'm the director of the Arts and Humanities and Health and Medicine program in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. Um, and I will pass it over to Patrick to introduce himself. Thank you for giving me time to grab my coffee. I'll like that. Zoomland is a strange world in which our private domestic lives and public lives intersect <laughs> in most interesting ways. Um, I think I could make out all of Ken's books if I tried really hard right now. So my name is Patrick Von Hoff. I am a professional designer. I work with um, Pam and Min um, at, in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. Um, I've been working in uh, health professions education for the last uh, 10 years. And it's also, and mainly through um, your office, Pam, that I got to know both Michael and Savita. Uh, Michael, over to you. Uh, or, oh, I, sorry, Min. Nope, stop. We have to go in order. Min, right. over to you, and then Michael. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Min Yoon, and I am an associate professor at the School of Dentistry within the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. And uh, through some weird path, uh, some unpredictable paths in my own career, I've come across a uh, PAM that has eventually led to meeting uh, wonderful individuals like Patrick, Michael, and Savita. Um, and it's been this uh, openness to connecting, I think, relationally that has brought us at, to this point. So that's kind of um, where we've, we've crossed paths and um, have been able to develop some wonderful artifacts that we'll be sharing today. Thanks. Uh, I'm Michael Frost. I'm an autistic uh, archivist, and I am incredibly grateful for all the ways that relationship continues to teach me about new and creative ways of overcoming the considerable trauma and related 
uh, challenges that I still encounter when visiting, uh, when seeking healthcare, uh, both uh, general primary care and oral healthcare. Uh, Savita? Hi, everybody. I'm Savita. I'm a resident physician in public health and preventive medicine at the University, University of Saskatchewan, but I did my medical school at University of Alberta, and it, during that time, uh, I became exposed to the medical humanities and met the wonderful group of people here on the panel um, and have continued to do work with them uh, throughout my residency work as well. So welcome to our uh, two lovely guests. So Daniela, Ken, I'm gonna open the floor to you guys to have a little intro. Well, I'm Daniela, I'm in Buenos Aires. Um, um, I'm a psychotherapist and I'm working with a lot of people who have faced very difficult situations in life. And so I'm very um, interested in going, in learning how to do my work, how to help in a better way and, I don't know, uh, cope with people. Yeah, so Ken Gorgon, but you've sort of been introduced to me this morning. And um, I'm mainly here because um, Pamela has been continuous uh, inspiration to me over the years. And uh, I wouldn't miss what she ever, whatever she's doing is what I want to be. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Pam, there's you a crowning the achievement. achievement. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, um, so, well, I guess we'll, we'll start then. Um, I'm really glad that you're here. So we're gonna we've we've broken up our, our uh, session into basically thirds. So we're gonna start with um, what we're calling Michael's story, which is really our story together. But our story really, Michael has been um, the branch. I mean, the branch, the trunk to our tree, um, in many ways. Um, and so you know, I hope to give you a sense of that as we're talking. Then we're gonna then we were gonna have a panel dialogue, which is really just a discussion. Um, first, the 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 group here, but I think we'll actually go to we'll go very quickly to opening up the whole group since we're such a small group. So just, we're gonna sort of smush two and three together so we have more time to talk. Um, I wanna start off by um, uh, talking with Michael right now to tell the story of how Michael came to find us and how we start working together. So, um, and I, I'm gonna, the backdrop that you're seeing here right now is um, one of two collages that Michael's sharing with you today. Um, and we'll talk a about these a little bit more um, as we go through the story. But what I will say right now is that um, Michael is an incredible artist <laughs> um, who has, uh, who through a, a, a difficult time in, I'm just, Michael, I'm just going to speak to you in the first person. It's always weird to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so Michael, you, you had this very difficult time, I think it was way back in yes. 2013, 14, where mm -hmm life kind of fell apart, right? You were employed at the university and you, that stopped. Yeah. And you, you realized you sort of had hit a wall in terms of being able to function really, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of, I think, if, if, you correct anything I get wrong here, but this is what I, what I recount from your retelling. Actually, let me back up for a second and explain an important dynamic between me and Michael. So Michael, you let me speak on your behalf which I take as a as a very um, I take I take as a very important um, responsibility, and so if I get something wrong, you correct me. But often, the the role that I'm playing is I'm helping you preserve a bit of cognitive capacity so that you don't have a shutdown. Yes, <laughs> right. So sometimes my role is to help you find the words. If I get it wrong, interrupt me, mm -hmm. and and um, and I'll just hand it back. And so for everybody else, just so you understand what's happening, that we we work this out carefully because I don't want to I don't want to speak for Michael without his without his consent, but um, sometimes it's very helpful, particularly in moments like this. So Michael, let's go back to that. So 2013, 14, th things kind of fell apart, um, but it was a mystery as to why. And so you, yeah. you had difficulty functioning in your job and you hit and you hit this slump, this actually quite serious depression. Mm -hmm. And in, in around that time, you discovered art therapy through yeah. a presentation at St. Joe's, which is on our campus. Um, and you got to know our therapist and started working with her and found your way into photography and digital collage. Is that a, is that a yes. fairly accurate summary? 
I actually f was introduced art therapy in probably 2011. And it was probably in late 2011, it was probably in July of 2012 that I realized that art therapy was the best route at the time for me to cope with the incredible depression, anxiety, senses of loss and frustration that I was experiencing, having just been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder back in 2010, but not being granted any real supports because I had essentially aged out of the slash not qualifying for any of the support structures here in Alberta. <laughs> So um, that's because there's so many things we could dig into there, but I'll, I'll resist that temptation other than to say you, you, you received your diagnosis relatively late in life. So you were in your, I can't remember, was you 30? I was 24 when I got diagnosed with autism. Mm -hmm. And you had a re-diagnosis, I, I think, again later. Was that right? Yes. Okay. So there's, I remember there's a, quite a journey in terms of getting diagnosis was relatively late. You, you had aged out of the programs that you were, that you would have been available for. Um, and, and so this was a, so doing um, collage work, digital photo collage was, was, a, was a way of working through that time. And um, guys, stop texting. It's going my year. <laughs> Um, and so we got to move on in terms of time. Yeah, yeah. No, you can let me know. Um, yeah. And so, um, so you started doing this work. Okay. So I just wanted you to quickly comment on this, um, on this collage. If you can just give us a sense of what this, what the general topic is, because there's a lot going on here and then I'll, and I'll pull out one piece of the collage to comment on. Yeah. Um, in this collage I created um, during the time that I was hoping to move into a co-housing project and it is exploring broad themes of how I understand uh, belonging, uh, community, what it means for me to actually live in that community and how I want to contribute to my community's residence and vocation. And so I just, I'll just ask you to pull out or just, just explain one, um, one small bit because something that's important to know, um, and this is going to come up in, a, in one of the digital stories that we created together, which we're going to show um, in just a couple of minutes. Um, the, I'll just explain the process here and then get you to explain one small piece. So um, Michael, from our conversations, I know that your collages are, are created through this meticulous process where you're photographing um, landscapes and objects of interest and um, you, you have a particular interest in landscapes gardening and also um, uh, machinery and vehicles a certain types you know yeah. about them you use those as kind of rich symbols to to um, for, for representation and so your collage here is a form as we talked about it before uh, in some ways a form of journaling where you're sort of doing a form of reflective writing for yourself which you also do reflective writing um, but it's also a form of um, sort of brainstorming in a sense where you're, I don't like the term too much, but what I mean by that is it's a form of um, generative sort of connection making between concepts. So you, you, you ask yourself a question like, how does consent relate to care? And you explore that through the collage by putting these things together on, on this canvas. And so here for, for um, Ken and, and Daniela, what, what I came to appreciate is that every single object you see in here is, um, this rich cosmos of meaning. So it's not a, it's not a simple symbol, but imagine it's really oversaturated or, or heavily saturated uh, symbols with, with lots of different kinds of meaning. And they're interacting with each other and, and sort of revealing things from Michael, but also asking questions. So for Michael, collage is dialogue. Dialogue between the elements in the collage. Dialogue between Michael and the collage and something that he's, Michael started using with with people like me and others in public presentations to open up dialogue around the challenges and issues that, that um, Michael's experienced. So Michael, can you pick out just one, maybe if you can, the, the, maybe the symbol that's probably most visible here for people to see is this large aircraft um, in this, I don't know if you guys can see my point here, but mm -hmm. Michael, can you just 
I know it's a painful thing for me to ask you to summarize that in a few words because there's a lot going on, but can you give us a bit of an opening into what um, what this can represent? This is really my first exploration of the many competing factors that I realize are at play when I sense I belong. Mm -hmm. And I realize that representing them through an airplane partly helps me get come across the space that currently I experience genuine belonging for only brief periods of time. And I'm still working to try and understand what are all the interrelated and very complex factors that come into play to create the tranquil space that one day I hope I can find again. So I'm going to go into the next slide. And so if you can just give us a, so this is a more recent collage. So the, the one that we saw before was one that um, you were working on around the time of the digital story, well, between two digital stories. Um, what is What are some of the themes that this one's dealing with? Um, this collage is exploring autistic burnout. It's also exploring the incredible senses of frustration that I still encounter, that I may be misidentifying other feelings towards and my hopes for uh, supports and a way of life that means that I don't have to encounter these incredibly stressful times with the daily frequency sometimes many times in a day frequency that I normally do. I'll just point out one, again, a reoccurring symbol here is the robo, oops. The Sorry. robot's observation point. Oh, I was going to get it, I was going to get it right this time. And you, you can notice, that, um, particularly observant people will see Michael here perched in the back of the boat. And in fact, Michael's cat um, is, is his lone companion here. Um, and this, so this, this boat has, um, has uh, kind of multiple meanings, but my, my quick paraphrase is that Michael, this represents on the one hand, your, your, your journey and all the things that you've built up to make it possible to have, to, to get through clinical experiences, to get through life um, by creating forms of self-advocacy and resources. Um, but it's, it also is a, um, mostly lonely existence, one that you had been yes. doing much on your own um, without, um, without um, a lot of help from others, this, at least when, when we met. And, yeah. and, um, and so this, this is a constant theme in your, in your collages. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get on to now the, the, the digital story that, that we all created together. And just really quickly, um, the recap of what happened was that uh, you, you attended some events that Pam had put on mm -hmm. and uh, tried to connect a few times and Pam being quite busy, <laughs> there was a couple of misses there and eventually you, 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 you kind of found each other. And um, around the same time, time, I think you had a, a chance encounter with um, Dr. Carol Hodgson, who's a colleague of ours who, who um, was unable to come, but was an important part of this. And, and Carol had um, a lot of experience in digital storytelling um, and had suggested that you, you might want to um, engage in a digital storytelling project and she could provide some support for that. And so you and you and Min and Pam and I think Tom Stevenson from Dentistry came together and started meeting about that. And sometime after that, I was pulled in as a person who had a lot of time on my hands as staff, not as faculty, because I think there was, I remember there's an early meeting and this gets to some of the disorienting dilemmas that, that, that we sort of talk about where I think you remember this, right? Coming into mm -hmm. um, Pam's off, um, uh, uh, Carol's office rather, and presenting one of your first storyboards and scripts, which was um, much like your closet, it was very thick and rich in terms of meaning, but we, but it was very, very kind of idiolectic. Like we, we, we had no way of understanding what you're talking about because you had so many metaphors that made sense to you, but didn't make sense to us. I remember the, the, the marsh marigold featuring in that 
and poor Carol was thinking, but what's the marshmallow coach <laughs> having a really hard time <laughs> figuring it out, right? And, and, I, and there's this moment where um, family is, like we talked about this and we talked about this really openly afterwards too, was where there was this sort of anxiety that, oh no, what if we can't, what if we can't do this? What if we don't have the time to give that you need to do this? How do we, what are we getting into together, right? Um, and that's, that's where I came in. Carol said, hey, can you meet with Michael? And I said, sure. And, and we started meeting up in one of the uh, quiet boardrooms and we started just by kind of talking and talking and, and we started writing the script for this together. And uh, there was this really important moment for me, I'm guessing for you too, you can tell, I don't think I've asked you, that. I think I've asked you this, right? Where, do you remember, of course, I've, we've said that we talked about this so many times, but I, I, I asked you if I could ask you anything and you I don't remember exactly what you said, but my, again, my paraphrase was more or less, yes, please do, right? Like, yeah, please. <laughs> um, and that was a real turning point because like, there, I, I felt like I could be, I mean, I have this kind of tendency to want to be as casual as possible and to say the things that other people don't. And I said, okay, Actually, good. I'm going to have to move you on. No, it's okay. I'm going to, uh, how much time do we have? Just let me know how much time we have because I'm dynamically managing. We are actually hitting close to the end of our panel discussion time. Okay, we'll get we'll yeah. get to this really quick. So we'll watch yeah. the video. So there was this moment where you said, um, yeah, so how many minutes left, Min? That's what I need to know. About 35. Oh, that's lots of time. Okay. Tell me when five minutes have passed. Um, so the um, so that moment was I, I was able to be really honest and say, I don't want to treat you like a disabled person. I don't want to treat you like you, yes, you're, you're what, how do you, what do you want me to call you? And he said, I'd like to be called autistic. I gave a lot of thought to that. Um, it's not perfect, but, um, but, but saying that I have autism is also not how I want to be described. Right? So we talked a lot about like language and also what it meant. And, um, and I got to confront some of these stereotypes I had, you know, from Rain Man to, you know, whatever. Um, and you were just so wonderfully generous about, about that. Cause of course it could be really awkward, right? And so, um, and, and that really opened up the possibility of writing the story together, I think, right? So, and, and, the, and I remember there's these, these, these days where I'd ask you something, you tell me something new I didn't know. And something that comes up in the film is, um, you know, what does it feel like to go to the dentist? What does it, and you told me that the sensation of textured gloves, in fact, any, any kind of very textured surface uh, felt very uncomfortable and even very painful to you. Um, and I remember feeling angry that people didn't know this. I, I, I felt outraged for you, right? Because I realized this is one of the many things you know, you're facing. And, and, um, and so at that point, the, we, we tried, I felt we tried really hard to work this out in the script. Um, any 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 thoughts you want to share in that, or do you want me to just go ahead with the film? Uh, why don't we roll film? Okay. Okay. So this was the result of that, and what I need to say is, so Mike and I work in the script, but we have been going back to the group, so to Min and Pam, to share and and um, and see if this was resonating and making sense to people. It felt very much like an act of translation, right? So I'll start this. So let me know if you can hear the sound. You should be able to. I'm just going to turn it up a bit more. Yeah. I am Michael Frost. I am an artist. I also happen to have autism spectrum disorder. I write and make visual art to make sense of my world for myself and others. This is a self-portrait. It explores the concept of reflection, a metaphor for the experience of receiving multiple and conflicting sources of information from inner and outside worlds. Autism causes me to have different sensory experiences and feelings than most people. Lights appear more intense to me than I think is typical of the average person. Bright lights, especially white-yellow, are overwhelming. Sounds jumble together. Everything comes in at full volume. Sounds tangle up in an impossible knot that I cannot separate. Small groups of two, 
to three people are okay, but situations where many people are speaking at the same time are overwhelming. Touch is startling and often uncomfortable. Sometimes it is painful. The inside of my mouth is particularly sensitive. I avoid eating broccoli because it feels like I have a mouthful of sand and sharp rocks. I feel I'm on an island. It is hard for me to communicate spontaneously. The more stimulus, the more difficult it becomes. I struggle to communicate my experiences and needs to people who don't live in the world of my senses. I try to build bridges between my world and the neurotypical world. Too often my attempts fail and the gap grows wider. My dentist's office is the most challenging environment for me these days. Bright lights, people, textures, smells, sounds. It is a perfect sensory storm. I have developed strategies to help manage my visits to the dentist. I wear tinted glasses to dim the overhead lights and headphones to block out the noise. Over time, I have learned that my needs are strange, that I am strange to people who don't experience things the way I do, who don't live in the world of my senses. Neurotypical people don't suit up like astronauts to go to the dentist. To the staff, I am an alien, an awkward traveler from another world. But if they lived in my body, I think they would want to shield themselves from light, noise, and the pain of touch. But they don't, so my requests are strange and unimportant when there are more important things to do. I keep trying to find ways to make visits to the dentist tolerable on my own, so I can keep getting the care I need. The sensation of a gloved hand in my mouth is still a problem, but I think I'm getting close to a solution. Most exam gloves have a texture that causes me extreme discomfort and pain. I can't tell what is actually happening in my mouth, but it feels like I am being cut. This is probably not the case, but I cannot be sure, because this is what my body is telling me. Like many people, I worry about the possibility of acquiring an infection. I know that Healthcare providers are human beings who make mistakes. I appreciate how difficult it is to maintain a truly sterile environment. Not being able to trust my senses makes it truly terrifying. Is it the tip of a finger or the blade of a curette lacerating my gums? I cannot tell because the pain is real. I have experimented with different kinds of gloves in hopes of finding a solution. Eventually I found that double gloving with two different kinds of surgical gloves creates a smooth surface and a sensation I can tolerate. I am proud of what I have been able to accomplish on my own, but I realize that I am at an impasse now. I cannot remove the barriers to my care without you. I want to enter into dialogue. I want to hear your ideas. I want to tell you mine. I want to work as a team and come up with solutions that work for both of us. Honestly, it gives me goosebumps. It's strange. It's very, very strange that I would feel that way. But it, I remember, it, Michael, it's really strange to watch parts over that I thought I understood at the time and now to understand them differently. One of the things in particular was when you talk about the discomfort and pain in your mouth, I, I understood it in that way, but I think in a limited sense compared to what, what um, I think what we both figured out later, 
because again, nobody has an owner's manual to their body, right? And so sometime later, we were, after Michael, you started just hanging out in the office and my manager is wonderfully generous. And he said, yeah, Michael, can I have a desk? So then we made it a thing where you'd, you'd come two, three days a week. We'd have lunch together with anybody else who was there. When there were students in the office, we'd all kind of pile together because that's all I like to do. We had this really nice studio environment happening. And, and then um, I think one day I wanted to understand the touch thing better. And back to the ask me anything, um, you were willing to let me prod you with pencils and chopsticks <laughs> to figure out how you experience touch. We can share that with you if you guys are interested. And so we did this touch thing right along your arms. So I said, where are you feeling it? And it turned out that whenever I touched you somewhere, you felt it somewhere else. And even with your eyes open, even looking at it, um, you experienced the touch elsewhere. You believed you'd been touched elsewhere. And that was a, that was a, really, that was a breakthrough for, for, I think, both of us, because you said, I didn't know this either. I suspected it, but I didn't know it. Patrick, we have 20 minutes left. Okay, we're going to move on to this discussion right away. But the, what, I, what, I, what that opened up to is some of this, oh, there's, this, there's these layers of um, difference that need to be discovered, right? Because you, you can't know how you're different from other people. You didn't know these things yourself. And it was, it was really difficult to explain them. When one, you don't know them. You don't know what other people are like. Um, but they're also very difficult things to describe. And so, so again, watching this, watching this film now, I see it again through a different lens. And, um, and it was around that time that you said, yeah, I, you know, we, we discovered that the pain you feel in your mouth, you were feeling in your eyes, in your ears, and that you had had these very, and I want to come to the point of trauma, that you had these experiences. This one I realized it was, it was, the trauma was the best possible word, but it was an awkward word for you because you know that trauma is usually reserved for um, things that we, that things that are not considered to be so, you know, so mundane, essentially. Sorry, my dog's barking. Uh, maybe you can explain. So I'm going to let my dog out. I'm going to come back. And basically I realized it felt like you were getting stabbed in your eye and your ear when you went to the dental office and that you weren't sure that that hadn't happened. And you also felt that nobody would understand that you couldn't, you, you couldn't make sense of what might've happened to you. If you could just yes. elaborate on that while I get the dog and then we're going to go to the whole group discussion. Um, what I still struggle with is how to comprehend these things and how to start succinct discussion with my clinicians about how the amount of rest I've had, the amount of other stimuli that I've coped with before my arrival at my appointment has influenced my current ability at that time to cope with the interaction that will be coming and ideally I can get this all to happen in no more than five minutes but I'm still struggling with how do I even get this dialogue to happen in the first place I keep creating artifacts that support a little bit of it but keep um, not necessarily cohesively supporting the dialogue or the interaction that I know can exist, can occur, can occur in a very succinct and inclusive manner. And one day I hope our continued collaboration will get me to this point. And it's not normal for presenters to have to get up and go take care of their dogs. But again, welcome to Zoomland. Sorry about that. So I, I, I think I, I think I'm, I want to make sure that I tuned in at the right time. So Michael, um, and you were touching on a point that we were talking about before the presentation, which was the the difference between um, the effort you're putting in now versus what you're what you're trying to achieve. And that right now it's very effortful. And so I just want to I just want to kind of build off that and, and open up to discussion. Um, so. Th three of the things we, we mentioned in our abstract were these ideas of um, creativity, um, care, and there's the third C, Pam, help me out. Curiosity. Curiosity, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I wanted to talk about those a bit and say that um, what, what happened from that original digital story, which was we were kind of fumbling to find each other and figure stuff out, and the story, um, we created the story together, and then it opened up things in a way that 
was really quite remarkable. Suddenly you, you um, I think people understood in a way, that was certainly my experience. I understood what you were saying in a way I didn't before. And I mean, I know that things opened up for you at that time. And so it, it gave way to Michael coming and teaching, um, teaching a session in your class with your students, with the dental hygiene students and using that, that, that digital story and eventually a, a modified form of Michael's collage practice with the students. Um, and so this, the, there's this constant activity, Michael, that you've been kind of leading us through is making stuff. Like I think the number, we did a count, we did, you and Pam went through and made a very detailed list of all the stuff that you are responsible for having happened since the digital story. And I think it's like in the, it's 20 to 30 things like, um, Pam, you and Michael and the medical students published an article. Um, there have been several presentations um, on campus and in the city that you've given Michael. Um, you've you've been an uh, invited lecturer in, like I said, men's classes, but also recently an occupational therapy class with Sandy Hodgett. Um, and you're a co-researcher um, on a study to enhance um, care for uh, um, autistic adults in um, in primary care with a leading autism expert. <laughs> um, and so it just sort of opened things up once, once, I think once we could see into your world, there was, at least for me, there's feeling of really caring. Like, like I said, I felt outraged at the point and, and which also comes back to the disorienting dilemma. I also wondered was what, what's my place here? So I just want to open it up to, to that. And maybe um, Pam, um, if I can start if I can um, call on you first to to talk about that that dynamic a bit, which I think was was uh, you you often talk about disorienting dilemmas in this work, and and uh, this come up several times. Um, okay. Well, one one thing you you pointed to an early disorienting dilemma, like how much can we get into uh, what is this, and that how how important the uh, work that you and uh, Michael did in terms of um, the final uh, digital story, which also led to another digital story that we're not sharing here, um, and the many explorations and practices and artifacts that have resulted have just kept on opening up understandings. I remember when you invited me, so this is more of a poignant moment or something when something really resonated, when I really appreciated something. And we've also done immersive virtual reality aspects related to the collage as well, which is amazing, and we wish we could share that with you. But um, when you and Michael had me read the script, Michael read it and then I, I read it as he was uh, reading it for the second digital story. And I shared, Michael, this isn't just your experience. You're not just alone in this. I've experienced this as well in visits with my healthcare provider you're capturing something that I didn't even put into words because I'm somewhere else on the spectrum. And that's just, you know, a too bad moment, but like, you know, it's irritating, it's wrong. I wish I was treated better. I wish something else had happened in that interaction, but it's sort of like going on with my day. But for somebody who that's, you know, I'm not saying it was okay. I'm just, it helped me to really connect with experiences I was having that were less than they should have been. And taking that seriously because you put it into words and to appreciate how much harder and more acutely you would experience that because you're not just brushing up against it in a, you know, in a way that's like, oh, for you, it's it's even more impactful and extreme. So I was being graded to bits, not just brushing up against the beginning. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I uh, that was that was a really that really opened up something for me as we continued on with this this and continue on with this journey. I welcome anybody to share another thought or a question. I wonder whether just we we're here. We've got fifteen minutes. It's, it's Daniela or Ken if you wanted to come in. We'll we'll continue offering thoughts and observations. But if you had a question right now. Daniela, you, why don't you go first, if you'd like. <clears throat> okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Michael for his story. Um, it was very curious because I, I felt many things 
while listening to you and watching the video. So it makes me think um, how, how much we experience in many different situations. And I do appreciate the effort you've made to share this and to try to explain. And I was uh, thinking oh, how, how can sometimes, what we can explain and how difficult it is to do it because senses are something that it's so personal and we, we don't find the right words. And maybe we, we understand some things from our own experience, but we don't know how to tell the other, the other people. But what I keep uh, with me today from your story uh, is that I, I, it may, uh, I, I have the feeling that I can be more aware of how serious or how important, how difficult this could be. And it is good to me to, to realize that, to, to think about that seriously. So uh, also uh, sharing what uh, Pam was saying, it also gives me the opportunity to, to give importance to my own experiences because I was remembering some bad experience I had at my dentist where I suffer a lot. And, and I always keep that in mind. And whenever I have to sit there on the chair, I always think about relax. My, I have to relax my hands, my legs because immediately I, I, I become very tense. So uh, listen to you give, gives me this idea of um, how important it is to, to, to know what we cannot understand, but what we can understand and how we can be together in those difficult times, even though we have differences. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Daniela. Um, Ken wanted to make a statement. Huh? Yeah. Share something. Go ahead, Ken. This may be a little bit rambling, but it's going to be a little different too. Um, I mean, first of all, I don't like any of these words like autism. I mean, that's just a word. That in itself is a form of misunderstanding because it's not understanding, it's just labeling where we can't, we don't know what the hell's going on. Secondly, none of us know what the hell's going on. I mean, at any time, I could just take multiple points of view. I, I, um, all of us have our crazies or don't know what to do about them, hide them, you know, push them under a rock, try not to show them. Uh, let them out to a friend, but not try to let them out in public. Um, and I think all of us have, as Daniela pointed out, um, you know, fears of our own. And Pamela, I was like, I, I, I don't, I hate dentists. I traumatized by dentists for about ten years. I traumatized by flying. I didn't fly for ten years. I mean, these things really affected me. But I think all of us have these things in the corner. So we're all on an autism spectrum in that sense. Right? It's just where we happen to end up in it. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna avoid dealing, I think, with Michael's problem. Because I, I, we, we can, by virtue of therapy, make it a problem by talking about it that way. What really fascinates me from a relational perspective is the relation between the two of you. That's more, much more interesting because somehow you really formed a symbiotic, I don't know whether, you know, I don't even want to call it, but it works. It, it, it's just amazing. You can speak for each other. I mean, and, and Michael is absolutely articulate. I mean, it's, it's got like, what is that? What do you mean autism? If you can't communicate, you can you can communicate better about what's happening than most people can about anything. I mean, it's like, and then put it into photography and videos and and play them out to publics and go to classes and tell them about stories. I mean, who can do that? 
not many people. I don't want to play up, you know, like, oh, oh my God, but rather incredible. And somehow look at that as part of the relational process in which you guys have been involved, because I, I just see that as like miraculous in a way. Um, and I, that, that's what really strikes me. It's um, sort of move through each other and with each other and promote each other in various ways. And, I, and that's, to me, how could we develop those kinds of relationships in which, in which that kind of thing can happen? But, and again, it's to say, I don't trust the words of interpretation so much. I mean, those are, those are not, we're not going to find an answer. There are no answers. They're just searching. And whether we have to search is another issue. Maybe better to work together to put together a video than trying to discern what exactly is going on or to it's so there aren't any answers we can find in words, but I somehow trust the answers that we find in our relating, the ways we relate. I guess that's sort of my two cents. But I just, I want to say how wonderful it is. And this is why, <laughs> Patrick, you started off as, you know, Ken being the guru here, but it, it, it's so great that you were able to see that. And that was really the focus of, uh, of the overall presentation and where we actually started from was to show and highlight that relational um, exchange and the relational building across the team members. And so thank you for picking up on that. Yeah. I have, a, I have a, a, just a comment to um, share on, on something you said, Ken. It, it's, it's, it's in a way painful for me to hear what you're saying because it's true and yet there's a lot of subtlety to it, right? Yeah. It, and, I, and I know that you appreciate that. Um, and Michael, I'm really curious to, hear, to to know where you're at right now. But it, so on the one hand, this, so this, this issue, this awkward issue of the label of autism or my label of ADHD or whatever it might be, is this is clinical language that, like you said, it, it if I can relate to the collage, something that Michael, you and I talked about earlier on was, Michael, your collage are the exact opposite. Right, they 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 explode like that's why we we eventually I, I was looking for a word. I'm like, well, it's a cosmos. It's these universes of meaning. Right, you can keep on almost like like it's fractal. You keep keep on going into them, and it opens up more and more and more, rather than shutting down things the way we do with a label, put it in a box. And so, Michael, you feel this tension all the time between the convenience and the signposting that a label like autism, uh, autism or being autistic allows, right? It says, mm -hmm. it, it, what it says is, yes, we are all different and all fundamentally unknowable, mm -hmm. right? We can get a sideways, sideways glance at best at the person who's there, and yet we still can relate. How is it? That's a strange, strange thing that we can know each other and not know each other. Um, that that was our constant thing is me trying to understand and, and you know and relating right through yeah um but at the same time being able to say that one is autistic ha has a it does something and it points to something that's very real the the dentist is traumatizing for many people and um but when when michael used that language he helped me understand that what he meant was probably different than what i understood and again, this is how we ought to relate to everybody is to, with an, this curiosity of, I don't know what you mean. Like, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what those words mean, even if I think I do. So I think it just really alerted me to that, that much more to, to, to be curious and, and say, I don't know what it's like for Michael. It heightened my, my sensitivity to not knowing what the words meant, if, if that makes any sense. Can, in, a way, in a way that if we say we're all in the spectrum, it, we, can, we can gloss over because Michael, I have never felt like I have never I'd never been convinced that I was being stabbed in my eye and felt it in my eye at the dentist. I have I can't say that I've had that experience. It's definitely very different. Um, but of course, I have experiences Michael doesn't, and ones that are very important. And and um, as you said, like as you shared your experience of not flying, I, I 
felt a real strong tinge of sympathy for you. Because I imagine that's coming from a place of suffering too, right? Like I, I had, haven't driven for 10 years because for, for other reasons. So anyhow, I just, I, I find that the tension really curious between labeling, it's useful, but then it shuts things down. Let me, let me suggest something else here. I mean, if understanding as a process by which we have to get inside each other's head, that we'll never understand right. each other with anything. If understanding is a way of relating, listening, caring, responding, look at it as a kind of dance, then, then you're doing that. That is the understanding. It is the ability to work with. Because we'll, getting inside each other's subjectivity, you know, it's like we're doomed from the beginning. Um, we don't even know if someone says pain, we don't know what that means because what is pain? What is maybe what means for you something different from, from him? So, and we'll never sort that out. So look at understanding as a way of relating, of listening, you know, then moving with the listening. Where do we go with that? And, you know. And creating, creating yeah. opportunities yeah. to keep on. To in the best. relationship, in the relationship. Yeah. Just, just one, one, one um, quick comment, Ken. Um, as Michael and I were working on this, I was reading relational being. I'm sorry, reading. I was reading relational being oh. as I was no, and I and I was, and I I was listening it to text. I put it on my on a device and listened to it several times over. Mm. And I found myself going back and forth between my, Michael and I, Michael, you and I working, and then I was listening to these. Like the book is so beautiful. Like I can't tell you how much that meant to me to be reading that at the time and. And really understanding our work together through caring. Like yeah. I, I really, I really care about Michael. Michael knows that Michael, you're my friend. But I also was receiving on the other end, of course. And Michael cared about me. And that was that happened that really? very yeah. yeah, very early. And I felt like, oh, I get what you're writing. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. I want to um, I want to offer Michael uh, the last word right now. We're coming to the, to the near the end right now, uh, but just also to say how appreciative we are that Patrick, you've been here to help with us. There's no way that we could have worked with Michael in the same way with our and even to say, I think it's a miracle that all of that we've been able to work on together um, the opportunities. Uh, and we're not taking care of Michael. There, there, was a, there have been a couple of times we've had to say, we can't do this right now and feeling really bad about that. Patrick, we've talked about this. Um, and Michael has said, uh, we just know Michael's going to go ahead anyway. Hey, Michael said, I have a bus. I'm driving it. You can get on if you want. <laughs> uh, he's taking care of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was exactly it, yeah. Michael, when we realized you were leading us. And this is a miracle at this university because we we're not we wouldn't be compensated we wouldn't be you know our chairs our part, department chairs wouldn't support this but because of patrick and michael and all that has helped so much so because we were misfits because our time wasn't metered that's the only reason that's the reason why i mean it's yeah. nice it's lovely to say that it's maybe it has something to do with who we are too of course but yeah. michael yeah. last word um yes i am looking forward to um Working with uh, my fellow panelists uh, to uh, try and fill in some of the details that tie together the many different artifacts that we have co-created and in the process hopefully get to the point where I dream of being able to have succinct, efficient, and very brief interactions with the primary healthcare system when I need that will promote a sense of community and allow me to feel heard, validated, valued, and most importantly, cared for. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, it was really nice to see you. Michael, thank you. You're welcome. Avida. <laughs>